Hello, everyone. It is August 8th, 2024. This is the Kubernetes Story Seek meeting. Uh, so today we're going to go over 1.31 planning spreadsheet. And then there's a topic added. There we will go over that. So the first one is uh, recovering from precise failure. Uh, do we get any update from Hamant? Is Hamant here? Mm, is Yang here? Do we know anything about this? So Yang's not here. Okay, so last time it says PRs merged. We can add more ETU tests. Michelle, do you do you know if there's any update about this one? Oh, no, I don't think so. Oh, okay. Yeah. See no update. And the second one is working group snapshot. Uh, so we continue to make progress about this one. Uh, so yeah, I need to, I need to review the unit tests. And then uh, there is a E2 test PR submitted. I think there's some test failures. So the author is still uh, trying to resolve them. And next one you see is a voting house E2 test. Yeah, um, Patrick has approved it earlier this week. Yeah, so it's ready to merge, but I'm not sure it can merge in this circle. Okay, so we're just basically waiting for, uh, yeah, whenever they open that branch to merge, then we could get it merged. Okay. Thank you. And the next one is change block tracking. Um, so uh, for this one, development is still ongoing. Uh, and I think folks are trying to set up CI and uh, trying to finish the development over there. So it's ongoing. And next one is enable privileged containers for Windows. Uh, are there any update for this? Uh, menu, Eddie, anyone, or Mauricio, anyone know? Um, the last thing that I had heard was that there was going to be some effort to get this to work on another driver. And uh, I think Mauricio had said that it was the, I forget which one it was. I think it was the Samba driver, uh, CSI driver, uh, which which might support this. So uh, I don't know what the latest is. Eddie, do you know? Yeah, so I think that's uh, right. So we're, we're currently evaluating the graduation criteria for that. So we still, the EBS CSI driver currently implements this feature. We're looking for another driver before we move the library implementation um, before we graduated. And there, from my understanding, there's, an, there's a PR open in the GCP CSI driver that is out for review. And then we're also looking for another driver to implement it. But once we have two, then we can proceed with the graduation. Thank you. Uh, and next one, always on a reclaim policy. Uh, so I think this one we are just waiting for the blog to be merged.
And oh, could be that. Okay, maybe I just said the wrong, the wrong row. Okay, so next one is wording attributes class. Uh, can we get an update on this? I think the blog from Matt Carey is being reviewed and uh, we passed the code and test freeze deadline successfully. Um, I think we just have to bump the feature gates in the provisioner and resizer out of two components. And then um, when those new sidecars get released, we should be all clear. Thanks. And the next one is PV last phase transition time. Is Yang here? Yep. Oh. I think we are done. I'm not okay. sure what's the status of a block. Yeah, there is a block PR open. Okay. It has RGTM, it is approved, it looks good. Okay, thank you for that update. And the next one is storage capacity scoring. So I think this one we approved it from the six storage side. Uh, we need a PR review. So I think because this is targeting a mobility too, so I, we have not uh, got a PR review yet, but otherwise I think we're good with this. And next one is one expansion for staple set. Um, yeah, <laughs> their meeting has been canceled this week as well. So, Okay. Uh, we didn't make much process and we decided to make a simple POC demo in the next meeting so we can discuss the problem we face about the shrink, uh, the shrink volume capacity. Yeah, we still have one thing to discuss. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, Hama, we were just asking earlier if there's any update on this first item. Oh, yeah, so is that still, yeah. Is there any yeah, update? The, so the main Kubernetes change was merged. Now the I have opened a PR for uh, an external resizer that implements the new behavior. And it also has implementation for slow retries. So yeah, I'm just waiting for reviews. Thanks. And then we have this non grace for no shutdown. Um, I think this one's still uh, that 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 ET test still outstanding. Um, there's still some test failures, so not got an update from the author yet. And uh, next one is auto delete PVCs with staple set. Uh, so I'm not sure, uh, is this actually targeting 1.31? I don't know what is the status. I think it was supposed to be targeting 132. Oh, oh, okay. Was discussed uh, a few weeks ago in the Slack channel. Oh, okay. Uh, 
All right. Thank you. And next one is Cozy Over Move to Ivan Alpha 2. Uh, yeah, so this one is ongoing. Um, just still working on to merge the repos. And then there's some new feature requests from uh, vendors. Uh, there's, there's another discussion about having quota for the bucket, but I think um, so some some vendors request that, but others like the public cloud um, object storage vendors don't really have this quota. So I think this is still right now, it's still, um, we're not going to have a common API for that for now, but there are some people asking for this. And next one, uh, see is that set car or all, all in one? Yeah, no big update for this right now. Um, we weren't able to meet today, but we're working on proposing some refactors to the sidecars to move business logic out of main.go and make it easier to have an all-in-one sidecar by allowing passing in like shared informers and shared clients, that type of stuff. Okay, thanks. Oh, well, is there an update from somebody here? I don't know if it's... Oh, so, okay, please let me on your show. All right, here you are. Okay, next, and um, okay, so those are marked as done. And then, um, okay, the last one was dropped because we didn't work on it. So that's all we have in the spreadsheet. And, and then, and so, Okay, so August 13th, so it's coming. The Kubernetes 1.31 SHEA date is coming next week. Um, okay, so now we have this uh, item added by Eddie. Eddie, you want to talk about this? Yeah, so um, I've added an item here to the agenda to discuss a quick one pager to get some initial feedback from you guys uh, for this issue that we've seen over the last couple of years, users reporting that their stateful pods are stuck in a container creating state. And that happens when there's a mismatch between the actual and reported um, capacity for volume attachments on the node. Um, so we can take a quick look at that one pager and I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, or we could also... Eddie, do you want to share it? Maybe it's easier so you can drive this. I have made you a co-presenter, a co-host, or is it whichever is easier? Um, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I was mostly thinking if we could maybe take a few minutes to read over it and just discuss it, but we can also do that as well. Eddie, I think uh, what might be helpful is if you can walk the folks through the doc, uh, talk through what exactly the doc covers, and uh, and then if folks have questions, then, then they can chime in, and, and then you can address those. Sounds good. Okay, so, uh, right. Okay, so yeah, as we, uh, briefly talked about there in the intro, the problem. Are you are you sharing? I don't see it. Uh, it says you are. I, I do. Oh, you we do can see. see. Yeah, I, I can see. see. Oh, okay, now I can see it now. Okay. All right, okay. please go ahead. Cool. So yeah, as we were talking about, basically the problem that uh, we've been having is uh, stateful pods being stuck in a container creating state. And this happens when there's a mismatch between the reported and actual, actual attachment capacity on nodes. So what happens is that the scheduler 
uh, assign stateful pods because it is observing an incorrect value on the CSI node allocatable property. Um, so we can we can easily rep reproduce this by you know simply creating a cluster, deploying the driver, and then you can have the cluster operator either manually attach uh, a data volume or they can scale up their workloads and have the CNI plugin dynamically attach a network interface for AWS. Uh, many instance types use a shared device model where network interfaces will take up a slot. Um, and so I've also documented here what the failure mode looks like from different components, such as the kubelet, the AD controller, the CSI driver, and how it looks like from the customer's perspective. So basically, um, their stateful pod will just get stuck in a container creating state uh, indefinitely. This happens because kubelet will block the pod creation uh, until the, all the volumes associated with that pod are attached and mounted. Um, and so, yeah, to recover from, from this failure mode, what cluster operators have to do is they have to cordon the node to prevent the scheduler from continuing to assign pods there. Um, and then they have to delete the CSI node object, uh, reinstall the CSI driver, uncordon the node, and then delete the pods that are stuck in a container creating state so that they can be uh, considered for scheduling again. So one important detail here that I call out is that um, simply reinstalling the driver is not enough to fix the issue um, because that won't update the CSI node allocatable property. That object is immutable. So to, to actually fix the, the issue, um, it, it requires that users delete the object first before re-registering the, the plugin. Um, and then various cloud providers have implemented workarounds for this. So for uh, both Azure and the EBS CSI driver, what we do is we have a configurable parameter where users can reserve slots. And then what we do is we subtract that from the total value in the node get info RPC. And that's that's the way that we that we sort of like reserve these slots for either uh, additional data volumes that cluster operators have, uh, attach or um, network interfaces that are dynamically attached by CNI plugins. Um, and then I also call, call out here the limitations with the solution. So um, one of them is that when users run into this failure mode, um, it, it requires user intervention as we talked about. Um, so, you know, once we do enter this failure mode where the pod is in a container creating state, it'll require um, the operator to go through these steps in order to recover, which is not really a great customer experience. And there's also a limitation with um, specifically a, a customer pain point for us with this solution has been that they don't know upfront how many additional network interfaces or data volumes they're going to be attaching, so they can only guess. And if they overshoot, then they're not using all the, uh, they're not being resourceful with the available device slots. Um, and then there, another limitation with this is that once we reserve those slots and then those network interfaces or data volumes are detached later on, there's no way to claim back the slots. So nodes are being underutilized um, so to address this, we, we've, we have, a we have had this idea, we put together a POC, uh, for it. Uh, so I'm happy to sort of record a demo for this group if there's interest, but basically the general idea is that we don't want to change any existing behavior. So the way that we're sort of approaching this is, uh, introducing a 
optional configurable kubelet parameter that cluster operators can configure. And so it's basically a, a value, time value, so that kubelet can go ahead and query the CSI driver's node get info endpoint to get updated information. And if uh, node get info, um, it basically update the allocatable property on the node. And then the other part to the to the solution is that we want to improve Kubernetes' error handling. So it's possible for uh, the scheduler to assign a stateful pod to a node that doesn't have capacity before um, the sort of before the uh, uh, before we're able to update it. Um, you know, say like if you configure that to only update every thirty seconds, right? We're not going to have the latest information. So in that case, once we do enter this failure mode, if the attachment fails and the controller CSI driver controller publish RPC returns an error exhaust for the attach call, then at that point in time we uh, want to update the new get info value so that the scheduler stops assigning stateful pods there. Um, and then also record an, e an event on the pod um, so that either the operator or an external component like the descheduler can handle that pod event, uh, such as by removing the pod and so on. So I think that's basically the, the general idea I also have here in the appendix sec section. Um, I link to where the API server rejects updates to the CSI node allocatable property and then how the scheduler makes the calculation. So, so one of the... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, like, uh, I, like I implemented most of the initial code in scheduler and in CSI and Kubelet for this. Uh, and one of the uh, reasons we don't do it dynamically is the scheduler folks were particularly very uh, uh, conservative about uh, always reading the CSI node objects, like whenever they are evaluating if a pod can be placed on the node. So they are caching the data. Like, I don't know if those things have been changing since forever, but they were, they didn't want it to, you know, like read the CSI node objects all the time, like, or periodically, or I don't think there is even an informer in the, in this plugin when the last I remember. So uh, they wanted it to be like, uh, so that's one of the concerns they had. They don't want to keep updating that information all the time. Can, can um, I just ask a, a question about the, the, the numbers involved with this problem? Like what, what are the allocatable limits of most of these plugins and what kind of, how many, like, how often is, is it being hit? Because I'm trying to get a sense of like what's actually going on here. <laughs> so um, as far as setting the the property, it, it only gets uh, set during plugin registration. So like when the node plugin starts up on the node, um, as part of that plugin registration process, Kubla is going to invoke node get info and then um, it'll create the object at, at that point in time. No, no, I, I'm asking like, what is the actual limit for the maximum number of volumes that can be attached to a node? That depends on the, in, on the for example, on the, in, on the instance type. So- um, but, but, but where does it come from? Like, I, I, guess, I guess the core of my question is why can't we just make the number bigger? Like that, that would be an easy solution. So like, can you explain why that's not a poss possibility? <laughs> yeah, so we, we can't just make the number um, bigger because what happens if say if, if say if you report 50 but the actual in the back end it, it can only support 23 attachments then but, but, but why like where does the 23 so, come from so so that's that's a uh, that's a property of the hardware on the instance so depending on the actual number of hardware slots that are available uh, there would be a particular limit that is supported now one we're of talking about virtual infrastructure right we're talking about like hyperscale so this is all software, right? 
Uh, is this local disks or persistent disks that are network attached? These these can be local disks as well. And uh, a lot of times what will happen is that even if the mechanism is implemented in software, there is, uh, to, from the application perspective, there is a hard limit on each instance that, that is available. So uh, as Eddie was talking about, uh, what the challenge is that if you exceed that number, then you will the the pod will not be able to attach to that volume basically. So right, right. But but I, what what I what I'm trying to poke at is like, can we invest in fixing the underlying layer so that the number is bigger? Like, if it's twenty three, make it fifty. If it's fifty, make it a hundred. Like, like it's just absolutely. a matter of absolutely. Of, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, you are absolutely right. That that is something that. Uh, uh, that we are aware of and that we are actually working with the relevant teams to kind of get this limit increased. Uh, right now, depending on the kind, so you're probably aware that AWS supports a bunch of different instance types. And uh, depending on like how old these instance types are and what kind of uh, workloads these support, that limit can be something as small as like 27, 28, something like that. Okay. To, to going all the way up to like 101 to, or 128. Uh, we're trying to get that to eventually be like a minimum of 128 overall. And that would significantly reduce the challenges uh, in yeah, terms the, the, of, you know, all, this whole problem will probably become irrelevant at that point of time. The, the, but, that's how uh, I was thinking about this is when this feature was invented, like most CSI plugins didn't need this feature because they, they don't have scale limits and, and we implemented it in order to avoid the problems on the few systems that did have limits so that you could, so, so that in the theory was you would, the scheduler would have enough information to avoid overwhelming one of these nodes. So it sounds yes. like, it sounds like there's a problem there and, and, and we should fix it. But like the, the real solution is just make the limit higher. Yes. Uh, and then, yes. You, then you don't need this feature. <laughs> you, you are absolutely right. Uh, unfortunately, I think the path for us to actually get to that uh, point where you know these higher limits are supported by uh, all the different instance types. Uh, that's probably like it's it's a long path, unfortunately. Okay, and we, okay. we I... want to we want to build something in the meanwhile that that would you know uh, mitigate the impact of that essentially. So yeah, I I would say I don't think just increasing the limit is a feasible solution for everybody. I think there's reasons why you know these interfaces are limited. Yeah. And and to, in, in well, terms of full well, disclosure, but, but let me, yeah, I, I, I want to, I want to push back on that. Cause, cause if, if, if end users wants to run more workloads with more statefully attached volumes and the node has the CPU and RAM to do that and the volume attachments are the limiting factor, like that's a, that's a bottleneck that should be alleviated, right? Because Otherwise, you're, you'll be leaving a different resource on the table if if your if your fundamental limit is how many volumes you can attach, and your workloads and and you want to run more workloads with more volumes. Um, so I I feel like at some point someone's going to say like, hey, this is this is this is the bottleneck that's preventing me from getting my work done. Yes, and and. Believe me, customers have come to us and told us that. So, so you know, uh, that feedback is something that we are working to address. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, it might take us a little time to actually get there. So we don't want to kind of just uh, leave our customers hanging in the middle uh, until that problem gets solved in, in the right way. Uh, and and this was this was basically the motivation for for trying to figure out how we could address something in the short term. Now, yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah let, let, let's focus on the short term solution. I just wanted to highlight. That. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think the point is well taken. So, and and I think the other part of it, which uh, which we uh, in particular, and I think there might be other drivers that may have this problem, but not everybody has this issue. Uh, the problem that we have on our side is that. Uh, these slots can also be common between GPUs and uh, ENIs, and uh, uh, there are a few other things. And and at the time of uh, initialization, 
there is no way for us to know that you know later on more slots are going to get registered and and we will have a few number of slots available for kubernetes volumes so uh, so the the whole thing around uh, solving that aspect of it is what really led us to kind of think about the fact that if we could make this parameter uh, mutable, then you know it would be off by default. Most people don't have to worry about it. But if customers are interested, then uh, by making this parameter mutable and only turning it on on a, on a as is basis in terms of when they need it, uh, we could provide a workaround that would help them address this this oh, particular issue. Well, I so I just heard what Haman said about like why the original version wasn't done that way. And so I, my question is, are you using the off the shelf standard scheduler? Do you have plugins? Do you, do you have any customization in the scheduler? Cause this feels like maybe a use case for a custom scheduler or a custom scheduler plugin where you can just add the smarts, you know, out of band. Um, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I worked on the proof of concept for this. I did not use a custom scheduler. So using the default cube scheduler. Um... Cool. Yeah. So yeah, no, as a, so it worked right with the default default. So if you mutate the, I mean, you you don't necessarily have to mutate the CSI node object, but maybe, yeah, if you mutate it, then yeah, so it, the node ha the scheduler has to read it again. So I'm just reading the code, and a lot has changed since last. So node information is cached. The CSI node node information we are reading from uh, Informer actually in the scheduler now. So maybe there's a way to do this in the scheduler so that it reads the new values all the time. Yeah, I, I guess the main thing though is is it's still prone to races, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's still prone to races because. Uh... Yeah, well, it, it's prone to races as long as the value can change. But yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, we don't anticipate this to be something that would get updated constantly, right? It's it's more of a situation where there might be like two or three times when at the time of startup as new slots come in and get registered and the and we get to know about it we might update this value or there might be a time when you know the node goes down and it comes back up again and and at that time there might be events which might cause this value to get updated but it's not something that we anticipate that you know it is constantly going to be changing and i, and, I guess by one question is like, can it be caused by say a user creating a pod and like requesting some of these other hardware resources? Or is it really like around node initialization time? I think it is mostly around the node initialization time. I don't think if a pod is, exp uh, if a pod is uh, requiring resources, then it would just rely on this particular value to determine uh, the scheduler will just rely on this particular value to determine if it can allocate resources to that pod. It is not going to, uh, you know, uh, it, nothing is going to change in terms of what resources are available based on, uh, based on the request made by the pod, essentially. I guess one, another possibility is like, can we somehow add sort of, you know, like node initialization ordering such that by the time the CSI driver registers, all the other hardware devices have registered too. So the problem with um, this specifically for AWS is that because network devices are shared with um, storage devices, what can happen is on node startup, there's only one, uh, what we call elastic network interface attached. But as the node gets, say, 30 extra pods, um, the CNI plugin dynamically allocates another um, network uh, device attachment. And that means that allocatable count is wrong. So it does occur because of some, you know, just in time pod being created, creates a new network device, and then that leads to that mismatch. So I don't think a solution that would only rely on node initialization, um, waiting for all attached hardware to join in would be enough 
for the main pain point for our customers, but I might be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, Eddie. No, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Like that's basically the issue. We can't know we can't know at node initialization time um if the CNI plugin is going to dynamically attach network interfaces or if you know a user uh, manually attaches a data volume. Um so in in those cases we need to improve the reliability of um the node get info allocatable property. Or a custom scheduler, I think would I mean there's a similar thing where there's just needs to be a way for scheduler knows about um oh that old allocatable value um is not necessarily the state of you know the world in AWS land. So um yeah. Yeah, I think I mean we can explore the possibility of the custom scheduler. I think just from a deployment perspective, that becomes one other thing that a customer has to deploy for things to work properly. Uh, you know, a lot of customers may not be open to doing that. Uh, it's much more palatable to customers to say, if we, if we go and tell them, hey, there is a knob here. If you run into this issue, you can turn on this knob and, and see if that solves your problem. Right, so so having them deploy some an extra component just becomes a, a you know a, a more difficult sell to them. What, what what gets them out of needing to install an extra component in the proposal? So, um, yeah, go ahead, Eddie. Yeah, in the proposal, their users won't won't need to install any um, additional components. Right, like the only thing they will have to do is um, set the kubelet parameter, um, say configure that to 30 seconds, and then kubelet will call the node get info at that interval and, and update the value. Okay, so, so they will have to change their kubelet configuration. And if they don't do that, they won't get the benefit. Right, or, yeah. so I mean, that's Part of that, that doesn't seem significantly different than just like saying, hey, use this other scheduler um, in terms uh, of how much work it is. So, I mean, that's, that's one part of it, right? So the other part of this proposal and um, it, is that like once we do run into the failure mode where a controller publish call fails because of the resource, resource exhaust gRPC code getting returned, um, then it makes sense to also update the value at that point, right? Because that means the scheduler incorrectly assigned a stateful pod to a node that doesn't have capacity. That shouldn't happen. It's an invalid state. And that doesn't so, require customer configuration. The, the, the idea that popped into my head while you were talking was like, what if you had an anti-scheduler that its job was to basically watch the state of the cluster and notice this situation and say, oh, here's a, here's a pod that, that's trying to create that's stuck with this resource exhaustion. And I'm just going to go kill it. Uh, and then allow it to get created somewhere else. Um, that would significantly, I mean, it wouldn't solve the problem, but it would significantly alleviate the problem, right? Because then in the situations where you did make, the scheduler did make the wrong call or you lost a race, something could automatically fix it. Um, and it would behave like an anti-scheduler in a way. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> the only thing that, that is um, not optimal would simply like removing the pod without fixing the underlying. Issue. Yeah, yeah, you still want to, to for the scheduler to make the right decision in the first place, but as long as there's a risk of. Yeah, and I think the other thing that that at least in my mind the way I the way I think about it is like, if if the scheduler is the component that's going to be responsible for deciding where the pod goes, right? It should also be able to have enough smarts to be able to figure out not to put the pod on a particular node if it doesn't have that capacity. The fact that you're now going to have a different component which is going to be responsible for kind of watching for that, it it seems like uh, you know not the best way to like this. Both of those you know, seem to be like a method, single right? component to. Uh, uh, but as as long as race conditions are, are possible, you would you would want something to resolve the race, and so, something like that would, sorry, would do it. Go ahead. Uh, so this proposal doesn't solve the race conditions that will happen in the scheduler because of the, you know, the scheduler already maybe over the limit. 
and or it is possible the scheduler is possible in process of assigning power that is over the limit so those problems are not solved well and we, we do let, let me finish let me finish uh, and but have we also considered like if uh, if a network interface is attached to a node for example uh, cause the csi driver to be redeployed with new values will that solve the problem or uh, that is too much to 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 like like that's too disruptive because that should not affect in existing parts so you're suggesting that we basically redeploy the driver mm -hmm. when yeah. when that happens yeah that's is that yeah, yeah, that seems too disruptive to me. That you will need to delete the CSI node manually, basically. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it will introduce a new kind of races. Uh, uh, and you you will still have pods that are scheduled but can't run. So you need to deal with them somehow. I put it in the chat, but Kubernetes already has a D scheduler like component. I don't, it's not like deployed by default on those clusters, but like presumably it could have a mode where it looks for pods stuck in this state and, you know, boots them. Yeah, I think the concern though was like, we don't want to get into this, like the, a node that is like below the limit will already get scheduled, pods will get, get scheduled, and this D scheduler is constantly kicking them off. So that, well, I, I only threw it out there as long as we're considering potentially racy solutions. I mean, I, I think yeah, the, 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 the real solution is either get the limit high enough that it just doesn't matter or have a custom scheduler that always gets the correct number. Um, those, are, those are the only two things I can think of that would not be racy. Yeah, the, there's no right solution to this problem because before we fixed it, that that upstream, the in Kubernetes community, that issue was open for years, actually. So, and, yeah, actually, uh, that that issue was the one that we've had a lot of customers come to us and say, "Hey, you know, we are running into this problem. Can somebody fix this problem upstream?" Well, and and I mean, we looked at it. It didn't seem like there was an easy fix, and we were thinking about, okay, what are the things that we can do from our side to kind of mitigate the impact of that, and and that's why that's what led to this proposal essentially. Like, I think at least from one perspective, like right now, you have to get someone with cluster admin permissions to like go and reinstall the CSI driver. Like at least if we do allow mutations, that part is cut out. And then the last part is like users have to potentially restart their pods if it gets into the state. But it, it, I think it at least removes one role out of the picture. Yeah, and then I think the other piece of it is that, uh, Eddie, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, this solution requires no or very minimal actual user intervention when, when pods get stuck on the node. Is that accurate? Yeah, so once the pod gets uh, stuck in container creating state, a part of the error handling uh, piece here for when we do encounter that is we uh, want to add a, an event to the pod um, so that cluster operators can automatically handle that scenario. So like Connor brought up, right, there's a descheduler where you can watch for this specific event and automatically terminate the pod. At that time, we know that the, the CSI node value has been updated, so the scheduler won't make the same mistake again. And this time can, around, yeah. Okay, sorry. The can the descheduler, when it sees events from pods on certain node, deschedule the pod and operator, and yeah, it, it has because it's uh, has to that's the one way of recovering. I was just going to say that can it also delete the cause the CSL driver part to be restarted? But I think if we have the allocatable mutable, then that's not a problem. But we still I think need to having the D scheduler going and delete the CSI driver pod is like super disruptive. Like we don't know every CSI driver is necessarily like well, able to be restarted safely, etc. Yeah, okay. So if yeah. it 
we should write a proposal probably for this and if the yeah yeah i mean i think the idea in today's meeting was just to kind of bring this forward to you folks and and see how you feel about it uh you know we we definitely understand some of the concerns that you have uh we also understand that you know this is this is a somewhat unusual change in terms of like making the allocatable count mutable you know uh there may there may be legitimate concerns both from the storage side as well as from the node side with this proposal right so uh but bef and before we want to before we do anything we want to make sure that you know uh, the folks in this meeting are convinced that this is the right path forward so uh, so we would definitely appreciate if you can provide like you know written feedback or anything else to improve this if there are alternate approaches that you think would make sense uh, we are happy to evaluate those as well but uh, we we didn't want to make sure that you know you were aware of like you know some of the thought that had gone behind this proposal essentially so 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 the the concern that Hamad raised explains why it was originally not mutable. And and I, I want to understand, Amon, you said you went back and looked at the code and they didn't used to have an informer, but now they do. So originally we used to read these values from node objects. And uh, yeah. at that time, the scheduler used to, if you see the code uh, in the our plugin, the scheduler, uh, the plugin gets the node object from this node on info object. And that object is cached actually by the scheduler. And it's how often it gets updated, how this thing that was not in our control. Then- Right, right. And, and there's a scaling concern. If you have 5,000 nodes and you have to go read them all the time, it doesn't work, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the yeah. No, node object used to have this allocatable property and it node was getting cached. But since we moved to CSI, things change and we are now reading the CSI node object, at least from the from a lister, which is backed by informers. So I think we should be good. So those yeah, yeah. If yeah. if that solves the scaling problem, then then the 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 reason for making it immutable to begin with kind of goes away. Yeah, yeah. And to be clear, we are not recommending that everybody that by default you leave this on. Like I don't think that for the vast majority of the time. Uh, even on drivers where this kind of issue might exist, it's a good idea to to have this API update and uh, get the new value when you know this is unlikely to be any change. But there are specific scenarios, particularly at the time when uh, nodes go down or when new uh, slots are getting registered or or something along those lines, where at least during that period of time there may be value in having this particular parameter become available uh, yeah. uh, and and updated. So, so folks can uh, cluster operators can basically turn it on. Uh, you know, uh, let let the node do its thing, uh, have things converge, and then eventually they could potentially turn it off, and and that would be the end of that. So, so that way, you know, you solve two problems. One, you don't run into the scale issue, except for a very limited period of time, if if if, if that happens. And then the other part of it is that uh, you also have a mechanism now where you can recover from these kind of problems in a way that doesn't require op operator intervention. So, the if the scale problem um, with uh, we have to obviously check with scheduler folks, but I do not. I do not see a reason why it has to be turned on or turned off. So like we have to like, if we are going to make it mutable, then it has to be mutable. And if Kubelet is going to continuously refresh the values, then we'll have to probably refresh the value for our drivers. That's okay. I mean, that's going. that's totally fine. I We would be we would be totally open to that. Uh, the reason why we had Part of it was uh, as configurable, and the default off was to mitigate any concerns by like having that periodic polling in place. So, so if that's not a concern from the scheduler side, then I don't I don't see a problem from our side on that one. Yeah, again, I will have to run, with, run this proposal with scheduler team. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think the concern would be if some CSI drivers make no get info expensive, like. It, if we're calling it a ton on their side, that it's going to cost a lot for whatever reason. Like... Yeah, I think another concern with enabling it by default is that, say, a customer has already um, provided a 
volume attached limit, right? Node get info is always going to return the same value, no matter how many times Kubla calls it. Sorry, is anyone talking? I don't think so. At least I didn't hear anybody. So okay. yeah, I um, think those are implementation details. We can discuss them in the proposal. So yeah. Not the Okay. So sound, yeah. sounds like uh so the conclusion is Eddie will write up a detailed proposal. And then we need to get feedback from the scheduler folks. Six scheduling. Yeah, so one question that we didn't have was who all should should we review this with? My understanding was other than six storage, we should maybe go talk to the SIG node folks as well. But uh, uh, if the if yeah, it sounds like six scheduler needs needs to be included as well, based on what you're saying. So uh, what about uh, from the scalability side, I think. So Okay, sounds good. Yep, thank you guys for all the feedback. I uh, really appreciate it. I'll work on those next steps and a more detailed proposal. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, and uh, uh, Hemant and Ben and Shing, uh, we may reach out if uh, we want to clarify specific aspects of uh, what we are proposing here. Uh, we want to make sure that, you know, uh, folks in this meeting are aligned with the approach before we go and talk to anybody else. So. Uh, so we would appreciate it if you can respond on those queries. So yeah, sure. Uh, ben, you have a you, have, you want to bring up something? I see. No, 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 I was just I was just trying to do a reaction. I've been oh, doing okay. it in Zoom before. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, okay, okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So sounds like we are in agreement, and then uh, it's also uh, yeah. We only have a couple minutes left. There anything else you want to discuss? Otherwise, that's the end of today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Yeah, Bye. thank you. Thank you.